As time keeps on marching forward, I find it's the platformers that give you a lot of moves, a lot of freedom, that I keep coming back to the most. I think that's why Mario 64 sticks with me so much. The toolbox is just so big that I can throw together all sorts of different solutions to the exact same obstacles I've been jumping over since I was six years old. I'll be 30 pretty soon, and it is still just as fun. I remember picking up Mario 3D All-Stars when it was new, and I found myself replaying these two way more than Mario Galaxy. I mean, hundredth playthrough of three games I all grew up with extensively each. Of course, it should be on even playing grounds here nostalgia-wise, but while Sunshine and 64 felt as fresh and freeing as ever, Mario Galaxy just kind of felt like I was going through the motions, like there's, you know, there's only one way the game wants you to do the level, and, you know, that's, that's, that's kind of it. You know, it's like bing, bang, boom, Mario go vroom. Still a masterpiece in its own right, don't get me wrong, like the sights and sounds and set pieces, but I find when movement is freer and you can approach things in a lot more ways than one every single time no matter what, I find the actual gameplay a lot more engaging. I mean, it's telling when people write programs that let you just drop Mario from 64 in any environment, and it is just fun no matter what. This is the reason that I find Mario 64 way more replayable. Rayman 2 is actually kind of the same deal to me these days. Like, I'm gonna love that thing until the day I die. But it's a masterpiece in the same way as Mario Galaxy. You know, it's the aesthetics, it's the art, it's the visuals and sounds all coming together to create a world that can just reach out and grab you. And you replay it again when you have the right excuse and it's like, oh yeah, you know, doing all these same actions again. Yeah, oh, this part, yeah, just do this. Oh, the combat, you know, fun idea, projectile based and jump and dodge, but you just you know, move left, move right. It's, uh, it's kind of playing itself at this point. My muscle memory's got this thing solved now, dude. When I replay Rayman 2 these days, it's really just for the sights and sounds, honestly. Now, I do think it's great that this genre has been able to explore all sorts of different things. Big, fascinating worlds, intricate puzzle solving, explosive shoosting, and even heartfelt stories. But the ones that always stuck with me the most were the very few that had so much to the movement. The ones that created so many different ways to get around the same levels. Forget the story, forget the puzzles, forget who you even are or where you even is just moving the guy in a nothing room. If you can make that fun, well then you got something I'm gonna be coming back to no matter how much time passes. Now I'm not trying to say that like this is the one good way to make a platformer or that other types of platformers aren't valid or shouldn't exist. No, like I do love them all. It's just that as I was growing up, I always found myself wanting more that leaned in that direction. I wanted more platformers that could also demand a little bit more from me as a player. Uh, but, you know, we do live in a pretty exciting time because now we are finally starting to see more of these games. Obviously, it could only ever happen with indie games, and in recent years, we've been finally seeing a lot of games that are starting to lean more and more in this direction. Whether it's nuanced physics that you can get a lot of results from, or it's expressive movement that lets you play the levels in your way. It creates the kind of game where the best solution to a level, it could be something the developer didn't even know about. And that is what I live for. <laughs> and now, I have been just completely swept off my feet by this game called Pseudo Regalia. Galia. Uh, the main developer I've actually followed for quite some time now, and I really do think this was one of those passion in a toy box moments, where they were just like trying to make movement that felt fun in, in a room by itself. And after winning a Metroidvania game jam with a very well received demo that impressed a lot of people, they were like, well, well dog, I should probably make this into a full game, huh? Fast forward a couple of months later, and it's slapped together into a cute tiny little game and thrown up on Steam for a very low price, and uh, Oh my god, within a couple of days, I probably had the most amount of messages I ever got about a game from fans in my life. Everybody was saying, dude, you have to try this platformer called Pseudo Regalia. It is absolutely amazing. And it was really interesting, too, because for the first time ever, I actually already knew about it. Everything I've been seeing from this game over the past year has left me impressed again and again and again, and I knew the moment it was out, I had to get my hands on it, and now it is out, I have my hands on it, so why don't we show you a cool frickin' platformer already? The title screen greets us with this eerie, ethereal wash, just the silhouette of the character floating through absolute nothingness, 
as this peaceful chime fades past. Starting a new game opens with us panning down from these uh, little goat prisoners to a mirror. And from it spawns our hero, Sybil. She's this tall rabbit character, and the only thing we know about her is that she's looking for a princess. That's it. Start the game and go. Alright, some pretty basic obstacles starting off, and uh, yeah, the jumping feels good. Physics feel really nice. I can land wherever I want without too much trouble, but it also doesn't feel like it just gives it to you. It's not too floaty or, or too snappy either. You got a nice grippy ledge grab, it also helps with that a lot. Oh my god, you can jump out of this! Okay, you know they know what they're doing when you can jump out of the freaking ledge grab, dude. It is so tight, too. Frame one, you're in that animation, you can already pop out of it. You don't have to wait at all. It keeps the momentum going at such a good pace. Oh, man, it feels really great. Pretty soon we find a sword, just a simple one, two, three slashes, but uh, doing so doesn't interrupt your movement. It's like fluid as heck. Now, you won't just be using a sword to attack enemies. Sometimes you'll have to slash a chain to drop a block and create a shortcut. Or sometimes you'll have to whack a switch with it to trigger some sort of mechanism. And man, I tell you, this is such a small little thing, but it really goes a long way for me. Like, I would never criticize a game for not doing this. It's just one of those different kinds of games things. But like, when you press a contextual button prompt and you just watch the character do this animation that you don't really have any control over, you kind of just watch them pull the switch. But then you replay Majora's Mask again and you just go <laughs> like I did that that was me I didn't hit a button to make my guy do that I hit a button because that's just what did it you know what I mean so like hey it's, it's a tiny little thing here but I love that the slash is also for interacting with the environment and not just for fighting enemies uh, I, I think it just makes it feel more like that I'm the one actually doing these things as far as the other basic actions go, Sybil can also grab and climb poles. It's really similar to how it works in Mario 64. You know, you tilt the stick left and right to rotate around it, and then you jump to pop out in that direction. Though you do have a little bit more control after the pop than Mario 64 gives you. And if you climb up all the way, you'll perch up at the top, giving you a better vantage point for a more careful jump. Pressing down the shoulder button will also make Sybil crouch down in place. You'll need this to duck under something like once in the game, but it's mostly for backflipping out of. You remember how Mario 64, you jump while crouching, you do that, haha, -ha, the backflip. Similar idea, but there's this extra step to it. Uh, pressing A while crouching, you'll instead flip backwards about a meter. Not very helpful on its own, but if you press the jump button again right after landing, you'll then jump up and do a high jump. So it's kind of like a version of that backflip that you need an extra meter of space for. And once again, borrowing from Mario 64, we have that classic side somersault. This one's a little more similar to 64 than, uh, than the backflip thing was. Yank the stick back while moving, and then jump during the skeet animation. Now, you don't like, you don't throw your momentum quite as much as Mario 64. Not at all, actually. It's really just about, like, getting the height than it is, like, an arc. So, uh, I think this move could be a little more interesting if they figured out how to really give it that weight, because, like, when you play Mario 64 and you figure out that you can do stuff like this only with this move, it's like, okay, that's platformer genius right there. So, if there was a suit of Gallia 2, this is one of the moves that I think could be, like, even more interesting. The backflip and the side somersault both pretty much give you the same result, same height and the same arc, so whichever one you use, it's pretty much just down to player preference. And that's good, more options to achieve the same thing lets the player have more freedom in how they decide to do things. And it only gets better from here because as we wander around the map, we'll start finding all of these brand new moves. First off, we've got a simple slide, good for squeezing under tight gaps and, you know, also good for just going faster. Later on, you'll also get the ability to jump out of the slide, letting you really fling yourself forward at high speeds. Fantastic for closing those wider gaps, but you can also use it for getting around fast even easier. Oh, we got a ground pound, another classic. Not only is this one good for breaking stuff at your feet, but you can also jump out of the landing for a really solid high jump. Once you have this, there's pretty much no going back to these two, which, which is kind of cool. There's a neat progression here. A handful of moves do become obsolete, but they were so useful for so long that they did still get to feel worthwhile. It's kind of like getting a better sword in a game, except you're getting a better jump. You just feel stronger for the rest of it after that. There is one more thing you can do with that ground pound, though. You can jump out of it before you drop. So, remember how Mario Odyssey, it changed the dive. Uh, you, you had to do it out of the ground pound animation. You hit the shoulder 
button and then you hit the face button. Exact same thing here, except instead of diving forward, you're back flipping back, directly 180 away from the way you're facing. And that felt so weird at first. It's like, why have a version of this that I have to turn around first? Why do I just have to do more work to pull this thing off in this game? But then I realized, oh, <laughs> it goes backwards because you're supposed to combine it with the game's wall kick. There, that makes sense. And, uh, oh, buddy, let me tell you, this wall kick, this wall kick right here, this is actually my favorite wall jump in any video game ever made. It is literally that good. It is literally that good. It is so fun. Unbelievably fun. The amount you can experiment with it, all the nuance to it. You have so many options, so much control over this thing. Ho, 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 holy shit, dude. Jump and kicking off the wall. You were gonna have a ball. Stick the landing just like glue. Every movement's up to you. And that's what it's all about, dude. I tell you, if you spend years and years playing all of these platformers that like to pretend that they have a wall jump. This automatic ass, magnetic ass, fake ass malarkey. And it's finally all worth it because one day a little goat comes walking along and goes, hey, no, this is how you make a wall jump. So why don't we get into it already? Now, it's pretty different from what we've come to expect from Mario or games with a similar wall jump where you just press the A button on contact with the wall or while sliding down the wall. Here, you're going to press the button a second or two before hitting the wall. Hitting the jump button midair enters the short-lived kick animation. You softly bounce up and you get a moment to steer that kick into a wall. And then you'll jump off depending on the angle you hit it at. And it is full on billiards, dude. Real angles, real nuance. You have a lot of control over this thing and you can get a lot of different results just by steering the character a little bit differently. Now I have praised wall jumps in the past, but do hoo hooed. This one takes the cake. The biggest cake there is given to this game because everything about it is just immensely satisfying. Bouncing back and forth, cobbling together a bunch of angles, or climbing all over the place, bridging wide gaps, or even just crapping together some bouncy boogie bullshit to get up to some dumb spot and... Oh, there's a key up here. Now, unlike Mario 64, you can't just keep wall kicking over and over and over. That would kind of break the game since doing so also gives you a little bit more airtime. So yeah, it makes sense. You can only do it up to three times, which is also cool because that incentivizes you to combine the wall kick with the other moves. And that's when the game really starts to get fun. When they go, hey, you're the chef. Here's the ingredients. Let the player cook. You see a place you want to get to? Well, you have to toss up your very own salad of movins and groovins to get there. So check it out. Let's do a little breakdown here. Uh, this is easily the most amount of poses Kevin has ever had to draw for one of these. Tori also did the background this time too, just so you don't have to look at my gross green, blue, radiant thing. Uh, but I really want to show you how many movement options you do have. So from standstill, that's four already. But going up just to a regular jump in midair, you then got five. You could kick, you can ground pound, flip, wall run, which you get much later into the game, and slash jump, which is another later ability where you can slash at enemies in order to bounce off of them. Sort of like Hollow Knight, except when you're hitting, it can be anywhere. It doesn't have to be below you. As long as you strike while in midair, you're gonna bounce up. Coming on over here to the wall kick. Well, that's more wall kicks you can do from this, obviously, but at any point you can still flip, you can still wall run, or bounce slash, all of which you can also do out of the high jump, or you could begin with a dash and then dash jump and wow, still that many options. Starting a combo with something that gives you a lot of momentum is always really fun. Uh, I always loved how much you can get out of the spin dash in the adventure games for that very reason. Homing attack is also a really good source of momentum as well, honestly, the way you can hit into a slope and then carry that kinetic energy upward into a jump. This is what I'm talking about. It's either physics or move sets, and just put me in a room and I can run in circles and have fun. <laughs> That's why the Chow Garden works so much. Now, this is cool because the way you combine moves changes as you get more. So let's say you don't have the ability to jump out of the slide yet. You can still slide off of a ledge, then kick to extend your airtime. That's still a lot of things you can do with just that slide before you get that other move. And that's not even mentioning bunny hopping. <laughs> you can do so much with that too. And that flip move is the perfect final ingredient. The way you can easily flip backwards up onto the ledge after kicking away from it, just L jump, L jump. It's such a fun way to end the combo. So, uh, this is all pretty brilliant. I really do not know any other video game characters that are this fun just to move the guy. I mean, Mario, obviously, and, uh, well, maybe Sonic. 
in Adventure 2, but you know, that game's half baked and half good and nobody agrees on whether or not it's valid. So may can I use that as an example? Doesn't matter. Either way, fact of the matter, this is beyond impressive. Like I really cannot stress that enough. So where are we going here? What's the setting? What's the goal? Well, in true Metroidvania fashion, and yes, I hate that genre name too, but I don't make language and I gotta say the thing that people know what I'm talking about. In true Metroidvania fashion, you don't know where to go. You're completely free to wander the map as you please, and it's up to you to figure out what you can do and what you can't, because you're gonna find a lot of rooms where it's like, you can't really do anything yet. You really have to stop and think about what moves you currently have. Is this enough? Do I have what I need to get past this room? And there's gonna be times where you don't, but you try so hard, you get it anyway. Like, the sequence breaking is absolutely a thing in this. There's also all of these hidden power-ups tucked away too that will improve your strength and your your health, so there's good reason to look into every nook and cranny and really see where your current kit can take you. I mean, I just wanted to look around anyway because these environments are pretty freaking cool looking actually. So uh, in good faithful tradition, the game cracks open a simple low poly, low res N64 look. Uh, obviously, since the N64 was the console I spent like half my childhood with, I do find it very nostalgic. The, uh, the soft sound of the music and the slightly blurry textures and, and all that stuff. But I especially love how the environment or all of these, they're like these nowhere liminal spaces. They only make sense in the context of playing a platforming video game. They're not really like a place. It's almost foreboding at times, honestly. And that is a reason I do replay old games, especially in their original format. There's something about that haziness and weirdness. It just lingers at the back of my brain. So, you know, nothing wrong with tapping into that every now and then. Got some good old 2D low-res iron bars blocking the way. Oh, and torches that feel straight out of Majora's Mask and that N64 hazy fog that lingers just meters away. I don't know about you, but I would rather be looking at this over like any super graphics game that's new any day. No, like seriously, you play 10 games that look like real life and it's like, I don't care. I would rather be looking at this. So thank God for indies for keeping these looks alive. The music is also undeniably fantastic across the board. It's this perfect blend of somber moods with the energy that you also want from a platforming game with all the moves you got. Uh, you leave the castle out into the empty bailey and you're met with this passionate piano, uh, but it's paired with these energetic symbols and it just makes you want to move. And then you got the theater music, oh, with its sporadic jazz and plucky strings. But my favorite has to be that deep, bellowing echo of the underbelly. A chill runs down your spine, but then a drum track kicks in, and before you know it, you're rocking out with ghouls and skeletons. This game is like heroin, dude. Oh, I tell you, like, it's, you got that peaceful drone of the looping, hazy textures washing by ya, and your muscles dance the most satisfying ballet of inputs. Oh my god, this is the good shit. Without nostalgia though, or, or at least some sort of interest in this kind of look and vibe, definitely not gonna hit the same way. Uh, you might even think there's just kind of nothing going on in the game. Which, yeah, the environments are pretty shy of props, landmarks, or furniture, you know, that kind of thing. They even make a joke out of it at some point. I suppose more props and detail could have maybe helped with navigation, like being able to remember each room apart a little better, maybe, sure. But you can't pretend there isn't something really cool about walking into this gigantic room completely empty except two big-ass thrones. I don't necessarily think games have to have a lot of props to create an immersive environment. Just take the original Dark Souls, for example. That strange emptiness you get from all of the areas in that game. It conveys loneliness, hollowness, a burnt-out kingdom with nothing left. There's still absolutely interesting feelings to be feeling when you're playing something that looks and feels this way. So just because we now have the technology to avoid this kind of look, I don't think that necessarily means this look doesn't have any value anymore. I love this kind of look. And besides, the areas do stand out well enough with their unique visual identities and with the little props that they do have. Though I guess I have heard a lot of people saying that they did get lost a lot, and I guess I would be lying if I didn't say that even I found myself running in circles sometimes. I think a map really is the best solution here, and thankfully the dev has expressed interest in making one. I believe they are working on that now, so hopefully by the time you play it, that'll already be in there. 
I also hope they have the ability to warp between the save points. I think that would be really convenient. Uh, just give me the Lord Vessel after I get all the moves, you know, towards the end of things. I think that would be a fair addition. And one last thing I want to mention before getting into spoilers is the character design. I think it's really cool. The floppy ears and all the costumes you can unlock too. That's super fun. And while obviously a lot of people are going to take very well to the character's uh, voluptuous figure, I'm certain the developer knew exactly what they were doing on that front. What I find so interesting about this character is just how tall they are. Because usually in a platformer like this, you get like this little pudgy short little character, and that always just kind of made a lot of sense to me. It's like trying to track the footing of a marble versus a pencil. Well, the marble is going to be easier to tell where the feet are going to land from more angles, you know, because it's a 3D game. The camera can go up and down and all around. Where with a pencil, you know, you kind of need these canned animations and magnetism to help guide the player because it's a little bit harder to tell exactly where those feet are going to land. I saw this indie developer ask about this on Twitter and I thought I had this big bingo answer that made so much freaking sense. And then Pseudo Regalia guy comes along, they're like, my platformer has a tall character. And now that I'm playing this thing, it's kind of really hard for me to continue believing what I just explained. The readability here is perfectly clear, and I could not imagine any of it being any easier if the character was any shorter. I guess it's really just down to how readable the animations are made to be. If you can do that, then I guess the character height doesn't actually matter at all. I can't believe it. This whole time, we've been playing as mascot characters over and over for no other reason than marketing? What? Good, I missed that. I wish marketing would do that again. I miss funny little guys. I miss when every game was like, here's a stupid squirrel that does backflips and everyone would groan. I want to go back. Please, bring me back. Alright, so now the final boss and ending are pretty cool, so I do want to talk about them real quick. Uh, skip here if you have not played the game yet, unless you don't care, the notes skip. <laughs> but yeah, here we go through the big final... battle. Down here we find the one we've been looking for the whole time, the princess. And she's here to fight us. The final battle ensues, and honestly, while I found the combat in this game like just kind of okay, this fight here really squeezes out some real potential. With all of these moves you've got now, it's this incredible dodge fest of all these different types of projectile attacks and tons of other moves too. And with how much he teleports around, you'll have to move very quickly in order to land those hits. It's actually a super fun fight, and it even makes me wish they had, I don't know, a couple more bosses that got this much fighting out of these moves. Once you beat the princess to a pulp, we then get this ambiguous text on a white screen. Not the kind of person you want to hang out with, right? The text continues to imply that this was all a dream, maybe? The princess, I suppose, was some individual from their real life that they once had a good relationship with. Oh, losing people when they change. Feels like you lose a part of yourself. It ends with the text thanking Sybil, saying they don't want to forget her, so they'll write her down when they wake up. I almost wonder if this was based on a dream the developer had or something. It's kind of nice. Feels like whoever the text is, they found the dream motivating. And this is the part where I start to think about the name, Pseudo-Regalia, what does that even mean? Well, Regalia is like royalty, isn't it? Yeah, emblems and symbols of royalty, like a crown, something that tells people you're the king. I know Pseudo just means fake, so like fake symbols of that, false symbols of that, I guess pretending you're more important sort of thing. Uh, maybe this could tie into the theme of losing a friend to their own arrogance or, or ego or something. A friend consumed by themselves until they forget how to value the people they were close with. I don't know, that's what I took from it at least. It's gotta be that ballpark of feelings uh, sort of thing. It definitely would make those somber feelings throughout the game make a lot of sense. And all the liminal, you may neaky ass areas really did make the game feel very dreamlike. I have had a lot of Mario 64 dreams that look just like this game, actually. I just replace all the textures with the textures from the castle, and you're pretty much looking at something my brain chef has actually cooked up in the world of dreams at some point. And being able to capture a feeling like that, it really is an amazing bonus on top of all this. Pseudo Regalia, it's, it's like a dream come true. It's like a hazy, cool dream that I really had one time, really come to life. This is the kind of thing that, as a Mario 64 nut that really wants platforming games to demand more from my inputs as a player, this is the exact kind of thing I have been waiting for to exist for years and years and years, dude. It really does feel like the sum of so many things the genre has learned. They take all of these moves that we know work, and they don't only just execute them really well and they function well, but they also combine them with all of these like really inventive new moves and it just it creates some of the most engaging 3d platforming 
I have ever had the pleasure of playing. I, I, I really, I really do mean that. I've already been seeing speedrunners crack into this thing, which does not surprise me one bit. If you like those technical speed games that lean into that sort of freedom and movement, especially if you grew up with N64 or PS1 stuff and love those kinds of vibes, this thing's gonna be a dream come true. And you know, if you're not that precise, exact demographic like myself, it does still have a lot of appeal across the board. It is easier to get a hang of than Mario 64, and it's also just a really great Metroidvania. All the familiar beats of gradually becoming stronger and more capable with each upgrade, each ability being a key to another part of the world. Exploration sprinkled with decent enough combat, and of course, that schmovement getting all around, it is out of this world! I guess the only other bad thing I can really say about it is that it's not really all that long. It is a small game that'll take you like four to six hours to beat the first time, and probably two once you know what you're doing. It's not exactly a big game, so I hope someday we'll see a sequel to it or something that can take these moves and, I don't know, maybe add one or two more and really give us the amount of things to do that Mario 64 has. Okay, well maybe even just half. But I guess length does matter a little bit less when the game is this damn replayable. And there is already a randomizer mod for it too, so you can get a ton of replayability out of it that way. Oh my god, think about that though. Isn't that just a testament to how much people really want to keep using these moves over and over? A randomizer getting made in less than a month? But this sort of thing really does go a long way in making gameplay incredibly engaging. Every move is something I actually had to think about, something I actually had to pull off, something I had to learn a quick little ditty on the controller before I was real good at it and I could haul my ass around like Superman the better and better I got. I really missed that shit. Right now, as of this YouTube video, it's only on the computer. I have no idea if it's gonna come to consoles. I, I hope it does. I think as many people as possible should be able to play this thing easily. I can attest that it runs pretty good on the Steam Dicky. Uh, that was a good investment. <laughs> oh, dude, it makes recording PC games so much easier for me. And to be honest with how much I hopelessly never ever touch any of the games I buy for the computer, it's amazing I've been lucky enough to have something like this that makes it this convenient for me. And it's crazy because otherwise I probably wouldn't have really played this place this until it hit consoles, if it hit consoles, and I'm shocked to know what I could have potentially missed out on. All it took was a version of the computer for an idiot like me. <laughs> but the Steam Deck is pricey and so are computers. I could justify the purchase for work, but I don't know if everyone else can. So I really think this thing should be on as many platforms as possible. Uh, a lot of people got that switch going. When I talk to my friends and they're playing indies, average kind of folk, they're usually playing on Nintendo Switch, so honestly, that would probably be the best place for this if you want a lot of people to be able to play it. If you do already have something that you can comfortably play this on though, well then buddy, I got amazing news for you! You do not have to pay very much for this game at all. It's only $8 Canadian! What is that in American? Like, 5 bucks? Trick or treat and sell that shit at recess one time, you'll have enough money to buy Pseudoregalia. So get your ass on that pseudo-regalia game. I'm not asking, I'm telling you. It's dirt cheap, it's malarkey cheap. It's like, it's like, what are you doing cheap? Like actually, like actually, I would have paid $15 for this easy because like, yeah, sure, it's not long, it's not long. But this is not a disposable piece of art. This is replayable. This is more replayable than 90% of new video games that get made. So to me, it's worth more than that. Throw money at this fool, please. Throw money at this guy so they can become super rich, have lots of resources, and then they can make Banana Elder 3. I don't know. It'll, it'll somehow be even better than GoldenEye. Actually, a game better than GoldenEye would be nice, because I just want a modern 007 split-screen shooter. I hate that the only split-screen shooters are Call of Duty. These days, I mean. Anyway, I got a podcast up on Patreon.com. It's only one dollar if you want to hear me talk about random stuff. The Pikmin music is still here. I didn't delete that. 